Hi, I'm Keith McCullough and welcome to another edition of The Pitch. We get six analysts, they get six minutes and my Q&A, so it's 60 minutes in total. Uh, we will combine the quantumental, or again, the signaling process with the fundamental, which is, of course, what the research analyst is going to start with. And it's also a preview, but a little front running here, Jenkins, of our new product that's coming out tonight called Top Stock Picks, where you guys get two each, two cars, like Formula One each. But you only on, on this one, you only get one for the next six minutes. <laughs> Love it. That's going to be an awesome product. All right. I will uh, try to use up the six minutes that I have uh, most efficiently. So we're going to pitch Boyd Gaming, ticker BYD. People on the call have definitely listened to me talk about this one. It's a newer name for us. Certainly uh, part of our legacy coverage, if you will. It's been often on best ideas list uh, on the long side, mostly over the last few years. But until very recently, it was, you know, sort of stuck in purgatory in our neutral camp, or as we like to call it, Switzerland. So for much of the last 12 months, the stock has screened cheap, but uh, by our estimation has lacked real catalysts. We think the catalyst calendar for, for the first time in a while is starting to firm up. So we'll hit on some of those specifics and then run through uh, some of the supporting slides. I added a few more slides, but we'll buzz through those and really just focus on the on the meat here, which is which is the catalyst. So. I think, uh, you know, starting from a 30,000 foot view, you know, help is on the way from a sentiment perspective, we think. So with macro, uh, Keith headed up by you, you guys are projecting a quad two uh, for the for, for second half of this year and think we're in a quad two environment as far as the, the market's concerned. Definitely see that in my in my sector over the last few weeks. Regional gaming, importantly, is at the heart of that. They are a top performer when it comes to quad two, both in terms of relative performance and absolute performance. And Boyd, when you think about a regional gaming stock, is exactly that. They're a domestic casino operator. They don't have uh, any international operations. They are as brick and mortar focused as, as can be, with the exception of maybe Red Rock. So you have some tailwinds from a quad perspective like that as a, as a top-down screener. And then also within that top-down theme, we believe that on the macro side, not just GDP, but importantly, the positive inflection we've seen in the wealth effect, in particular real estate wealth that started uh, in the second half of last year, is going to start playing through and really start to enhance that spend per visitor trend that has been under pressure really for the last 12, 18 months. You've had a concerted effort by the casino operators to no longer market to the lower end of the database. Instead, they're focusing on their top customers. However, when the real estate wealth effect turns over, or at least starts to decelerate and in some cases went negative last year, uh, you know, you're going to have a little <coughs> bit of a damper on spend per visitor trends that has inflected. So two tailwinds, we think one being from a top down sentiment perspective, the other being uh, more from a, uh, a quantitative perspective. We can definitely prove this historically that the real estate wealth effect and just broader wealth effect has a positive uh, has positive implications on spend per visitor and thus GGR trends. So that's at a 30,000 foot view. We'll boil it down a little closer to, to the industry level here, which is comps are starting to ease materially. So a little bit different than other components of our coverage that you know have some difficult comps in Q2, Q3, whereas regional gaming was one of the early recovery stories coming out of COVID. So you have comps easing materially starting in Q2. Q1 was crushed by weather in January, but since then you've had trends really start to accelerate uh, supported by February GGR, which optically didn't look as strong. But if you really boil it down, the exit rate was solid. And then March, uh, as far as we can glean, was also really solid. So you're going from a, a situation where the last 18 months, gross gaming revenue trends on, on a growth basis were basically flat to down. And now we're starting to get back into growth mode. At the same time you had over the last two years, you had costs started to, to, to finally pick up. There was deferred uh, wage uh, increases and what have you, all that started to play through at a time when uh, GGR trends were, were rolling over and, and comping negative. So you're going from headwinds over the last few last year and a half on the cost side and revenue side to now tailwinds in that uh, there's there's some easy comps on the cost side. At the company level, Boyd uh, uh, actually underperformed relative to peers in Q2, Q3 of last year. Again, when you think about deferred uh, raises and bonus accruals, all those kind of things really broke against them. And they had two really tough quarters in the second quarter and third quarter last year, ended the year on a, on a decent note. But we think, you know, from a comp perspective, they are sort of right at the heart of the opportunity when it comes to harnessing what we believe is a, a great setup on the top line uh, for the regional gaming industry, but for them as well. So we think we're going to be in a situation here where starting in Q2, 
where, and this will start to get priced in, we think earlier, where the narrative is going to shift from, oh, Boyd has margins falling and they're losing share on the top line to, hey, margins are stabilizing and actually have upside into next year and Boyd's actually gaining share. Interestingly, uh, in the February GGR data releases that we get from the states, Boyd's share started to tick back up already. So really like what we're seeing in er you know, the early signs of, of this catalyst we think are already starting to play out. So um, you know, in addition to the industry level, the macro, and, and some of the, the catalysts we see uh, that, that are gonna, gonna, gonna drive, like, likely drive positive estimate revisions, you know, Boyd has significant opportunities in the online segment they're tied, attached at the hip to uh, FanDuel, which is the number one operator in the online gaming space here in the U in the U.S. And then they also have significant growth uh, through their downtown Las Vegas operations, which do not appear reflected in, in estimates either. So higher numbers, modestly higher valuation, get us to a much higher stock price from here. And what I really like about the story is if you're some of the parts person and you like to invest that way, I think this story's got you covered. If you're more Garpy and waiting for that kind of valuation and catalyst uh, path to, to match, got you covered. And if you're rate of change and pods focused, like we talk about all the time, I think you're covered here too with the next couple quarters looking at accelerating top line and accelerating EBITDA growth. So just some, some of the slides that we provided here, I think slide seven is a good one to focus on just for the near term rate of change. So January obviously was a a really tough month impacted by weather. February was a building block getting back to that kind of trend that we saw in November, December of last year. The exit rate out of 23 was really solid. And then now for March, what we can glean from the uh, some of the states that, that provide us a little bit of indication of, of how the month's tracking, actually a pickup from what we saw in February. So all told, you know, we're seeing accelerating top line and then, it, you know, easier comps on the, on the cost side, leading to higher numbers and ultimately a higher stock price. And that's it. I like it. Got it yeah. right, right before the uh, right before the buzzer, or right yeah. at the buzzer. You know what, people? Um, you know, people that 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 generally don't characterize what happened properly last year, in particular, small to mid cap stocks. Boyd over the July to October beatdown, which the Russell 2000, by the way, went down 18 percent, and we were short that. Uh, but the you know Boyd went down 26 percent from 72, and has since been recovering. So it's been waiting, uh, Jenks, to get back to bullish trend, and it just did. So we just got that. So trend signal level for uh, Boyd is 63.71. So that's a big thing. Six billion cap, it fits like what we like. We want to be long, small, mid cap growth. I, I guess that's one question. It's got relatively low short interest too, but it, it, at times people look at this as a growth stock when it has new capacity. At other times they yep. look at it as a value stock. Currently it's valuation implies it's a value stock. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a, that's a that's a fair assumption. But I think what's interesting about this, and I don't know if, if, if maybe this was leading to your next question or but I'm going to jump ahead to a thought that that, that your your statement just uh, spurred, which is I think you have growth value. It's it, it's value like a value stock, but there's growth under the hood here where yep. you have a FanDuel stake. They own five percent of FanDuel USA. By the way, that's the number one uh, uh, operator that's worth at least we think 12 bucks a share. They can monetize that at any point in time. From their perspective, they think they want to, you know, hold on to it. You know, now that Flutter, uh, the owner of FanDuel is listed here in the US, I think that's going to, you know, they're going to get a lot more oh, more credit for that stake that they have. They have an online gaming component which is uh they're under their Stardust brand. They're working with FanDuel to grow that. They have a management contract with the Native American tribe. They have growth in their downtown segment. You know, if you look at their Las Vegas locals business, which is a high margin and historically high growth business, they're facing some some competition from Red Rock. So that business, that segment is not going to grow. But there's a lot of growth under the hood here. I mean, over the next couple of years, they're going to grow their EBITDA base, you know, mid single digits, mid single digits, which relative to history, that's very solid growth for a regional gaming company. That's growthy uh, for a regional gaming company. I think what's good is you have these other kickers that once the acceleration story comes to bear, you're going to start getting credit for those. When when revenues are decelerating and GDP is decelerating, wealth effects decelerating, you're not going to get credit for your FanDuel stake and your online gaming opportunity and all that stuff. But I think now you start to get credit for a lot of those goodies. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's why we're, you know, that's why we're pounding the table here. I like it. Signal likes it. You like it. And uh, you get cut off short because I talked too much at the beginning of the intro. So we got to stay on time here. Appreciate there it. Go. The Sean yeah. Jenkins doing a great job for the team. <laughs> Uh, up next, the one and only Reet Rob Simone, not wearing a Ranger hat today.
not yet. Well, they did clinch a playoff spot, so uh, it's uh, it's getting down to it. But um, yeah, so today uh, I'm going to talk uh, about <clears throat> new long idea. We're actually starting to like get some longs on the board and reach for the first time in about a year and a half. It's called American Healthcare REIT, uh, ticker AHR. Yep. So we, um, it's a recent IPO. We don't um, have IPOs in MySpace too often. This one is kind of interesting because there, there's actually a, um, a budding IPO pipeline. Um, and the pricing of this particular deal is actually part of the opportunity here set against like what's actually a pretty interesting and improving backdrop. So there are a couple of big IPOs in the pipeline. And this one, I think there was some degree, this is, this is purely like my, my view and my, um, uh, somewhat speculation, but I have reason to believe this is true. Uh, the deal was priced towards the low end of the range um, <clears throat> uh, that, that was initi initially contemplated. I think to get this one out of the gate and kind of like grease the market, so to speak, for some of the bigger deals that are coming later that the bankers are really going to earn their fees off of. But, um, but basically, AHR is a, uh, a, a new former <clears throat> non-traded REIT that IPO'd. It's a diversified healthcare REIT. Uh, we think it's probably worth about, you know, call it 17 or $18 a share. And the general idea is that, um, you know, you have essentially what's like a 50% Redea or shop portfolio. Redea is just a structure within the REIT world for healthcare and, um, and lodging REITs that allows you as the owner to own the economics um, after, well, basically the EBITDA, the property as opposed to the rent. And SHOP stands for Seniors Housing Operating Properties. That, that's typically like synonymous with Rodea. Uh, this company, like the rest of Seniors Housing, which is probably going to be the beneficiary of some of the best fundamentals, aka coming off a uh, depressed lower base of occupancy and essentially no new supply coming online. It has one of the best supply profiles in REITs. Um, it's coming off a lower base. It's priced, um, you know, well, it's growing a little bit slower than Well Tower, growing a little bit faster than Ventas or should, but it's priced like a SNF, a skilled nursing facility like Omega or Sabra. So there's this really interesting, like rate, favorable rate of change profile, a, a structural um, kind of, you know, um, I guess you could say anomaly where it was priced low out of the gate and, and it's cheap. And, and we like to, um, you know, kind of look at names like that as, as long opportunities. So, I guess like the risk here would be that they don't execute or that their operators don't execute. Uh, and that would like obviously depress them or, or not give them the cost of capital that they need to like grow externally. But I think like time is basically going to prove that out. If we could jump ahead to, um, to slide 17, this is really like the, um, the upside, right? Like a manifestation of the upside. So they, um, they have a really unique, there's a, by the way, on slide 15, I don't want to go through it. It's just more for the people's background because it's very complicated, but they actually guys, can we, yeah, can we pull that up? Yeah, it's up there. So this is the kind of stuff that like I love doing as a read analyst. Um, it's, there are lots of like unique kind of features within REITs that make them fun to analyze. But basically this company has a unique structure called Trilogy inside of it um, that has a very like uh, AHR specific property type called an integrated senior housing ca campus. And put simply what that is, it's like a range of acuity. So from IL up to IL's independent living, it's like um, apartments for seniors up through memory care. And then SNFs layered on. Usually SNFs are carved out and separate. And what they do is they bring people in through the SNFs and, or bring seniors in and patients in through the SNFs and then kind of like let them age in place. So it's a very unique model. If now we go through to slide 17, what this is really showing is the margin upside, right? So there's kind of like this pre-pandemic world and post-pandemic world. Pre-pandemic was where everything was kind of humming along and operating, you know, um, as it should. The pandemic obviously like blew up seniors and many of these names are, are operating well below pre-pandemic levels of, of occupancy. I would rather pay north of a seven cap for AHR growing faster than Ventas than paying a three and a half cap for Well Tower that's growing the fastest. Now, Well Tower may work, but this one should benefit from the same tailwinds and is priced more attractively. So next slide, this is um, a NAV. Um, yeah, slide 18. This is a NAV, uh, kind of the thing that REITs do day to day, uh, read analysts do day to day. And, and basically what we're doing is we're building up different components of AHR and getting to like a $17 to $18 stock price that's really e easily achievable. One thing I would note, this I actually did in my black book 
um, I think it was a month ago now, before the company reported its fourth quarter. On the rightmost column, second line down, that 266777, that was my estimate for um, next 12 months at a lot, cash on a lie for this business, based upon the information we had. Rightmost column, second number down, 266777. The company, as of the fourth quarter, printed something just shy of, um, I think it was 285. So my numbers were actually too low. And that's really interesting because like I was seeing significant upside and the company is actually like trending a little bit better than I thought, in addition to like receiving the benefit of all these tailwinds. So I think you can buy HR. It's um, it's going to work over the next like oh, definitely over tail duration. And I think there's like kind of a unique opportunity here. And that's all for me. Tight, Reet Rob, tight uh, as usual. So if you look at the I mean, it doesn't have uh, when we when we look at, uh, you know, multi duration risk, we look at trade trends and tails. Uh, it doesn't actually have trend and tail data being intermediate to long term because it's an IPO. That said, it's an IPO. And IPO is a factor exposure you want to be long in quad two mm -hmm. when the economy is accelerating because people are looking for growth. Now, I guess uh, that's this is one question. I mean, it also has small cap because it's only two billion in cap. Um, how yeah. does it typically, I mean, like you said, it's atypical to have a read IPO. Um, but I look at the shareholder list, it's two billion in cap. So it's pretty liquid and it's breaking out to new highs. That's good. Um, but it really only has two big institutional holders so far on the board. And I assume that that just needs to manifest because, and one's millennium by the way, which is atypical for a hedge fund to be number one. Uh, and again, the data yeah. may have changed, but them and principal global investors are almost 10% of the ownership. Yeah, I mean, what's gonna happen is, it, and it's mid cap in like the broader, uh, you know, sense the word, but it's actually like a, a pretty like, you know, big REIT. REITs tend to like <clears throat> be very concentrated at the top, but then fall off pretty quickly. This is actually like a fairly sizable REIT if you think about equity market cap and um, enterprise value. And I think what's going to happen is as these things, as this <coughs> thing executes and it just grows faster than the rest of the space and people are looking for things to buy, you're going to see some of the larger REIT dedicated investors like maybe Cohen and Steers or, um, you know, AMP or Reef, uh, sorry, D formerly Reef, D DWS guys, not to say that they're in it or they would be in it, but guys like that take an interest in a name like this and kind of need to own it. So I would expect that list to, to move around pretty substantially and get more concentrated at the top. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, that's endemic to your sector. I guess that's part of the problem that the sector had is that small caps were short mm -hmm. until you got into quad, uh, narrow quad one or quad two. The, um, what is the feedback that you get quickly from institutions? Because you do have, and we have, this huge competitive advantage in that we can preview IPOs, you know, people who have mm -hmm. banks and broker dealers can't, uh, and we have obviously explicit uh, buyer sells on these. We don't beat around the bush. So what's been the feedback so far? Yeah, feedback's been, um, first of all, ha like really glad that Hedge is covering it. That's, that's definitely a good thing for exactly the reasons you said, um, but also uh, keep doing these, right? So, well, well for, first feedback on AHR, like actually that I was being too conservative, for what it's worth, that was that was the biggest the biggest piece of feedback, and that kind of manifested itself when their numbers turned out better. But more broadly, like keep doing these as some of the um, you know the PE owned companies are looking for an exit. Uh, you know, Lineage comes to mind. Lineage Logistics is on the docket. That's a big one. Um, that's going to be a competitor to Americold. Like kind of kind of keep working on them, right? Because um, a that well, I, I don't want to impute the sell side too much, but uh, people are just looking for an objective opinion. But in general, I, I was being too conservative, not generous enough. All right, good to know. Thank you. Thanks for keeping it tight. Now I got a live one with somebody who's been hotter than a firecracker, Bielsi. You know, you you, you always you kind of like look at me and chuckle when I said I, one time I call I said he's flamboyant. He's the opposite of flamboyant. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little self-imposed mm -hmm. pressure from the last one. So yeah, but I, I wanted. To, I wanted to be back here and do it again. Because so. last one was Celsius. The last one was Celsius. Right, right. Um, and just as Celsius was one of my cars, this one is one of my cars today too. Okay, so, good. I don't know if this surprised you, but this one is Bellring Brands, ticker BRBR. Yep. Bellring Brands, for those who don't know it, owns three brands, Premier Protein, Dymatize, and Power Bar. Uh, depending on you know, what, what you sort of consume or, or how you exercise, you, you might be familiar with one versus the other. But I think Bellring Brands, is positioned well for the secular growth and protein consumption combined with convenience. You know, when you can marry that a secular change in how people are consuming with convenience, you have a winner, right? So tailwinds in health, fitness, and wellness are driving this growth and functional 
beverage category growth. And Premier Protein is the number one RTD, which is ready to drink protein shake. And they have some new capacity expansion that's just sort of come on in the last couple months. And that's going to sort of turbocharge the future growth. That their inventory levels at retail have been below target, and this is due to production capacity constraints. It's not that easy to add the type of um, capacity. You know, these are um, Tetra Pak type um, packaging. You know, it's uh, it's uh, you know it's something that doesn't spoil, so it, it has to be a very sort of clean environment. The company is on track to increase its RTD shake production capacity by 20% this year, and future announcements to expand this capacity further are going to be another future positive catalyst, which I expect later this year. By partnering with co-manufacturers, the company enjoys the, these high 20% EBITDA margins with minimal capex. I think you'd be very surprised by how, how little capex is required. So I am modeling both on a trade and trend basis EPS upside, pointing to uh, you know 30% plus uh, share appreciation um, potential uh, with some of the highest organic volume and EPS growth kagers in, in consumer staples, I think this valuation should be among the highest in my group. And, but it's just not as well known, right? So leverage is, is soon going to fall below two times. I, I, I have that this year. And then that will start um, a round of share repurchases because, I, like I said, they have like two to three million dollars of CapEx. So all that free cash flow is going to, in the future, go towards share repurchase. A little bit on the company's history on, on slide 23. So this company is a spin out of Post Holdings. So Post Holdings way back in 2013, 2014, saw the, the potential growth in convenient nutrition. And so they bought a couple brands, Premier Nutrition, Dimatize, and Power Bar. And you know, they've now completely spun this off to the existing shareholders and it is its own company now. But the CEO Post is the chairman of Bellring. That's their, their link still. And of course, um, Post is also one of the co-manufacturers for um, Premier Protein. So in the next slide, we have, so if you haven't seen Premier Protein, this is what, we're, we're, what I'm talking about here. Premier Protein is the number one, in terms of market share, uh, protein brand at 22%. It has the highest household penetration in the category at 17%, but 17% is actually quite low, and that's where things can keep getting better in the future. Shake consumption has been very, very strong in Q4, it was 29%. And again, this was held back by uh, capacity constraints. And, and nutrition bars, in, in comparison, have a household penetration rate of 45%, and RTD shakes have a household penetration of only 25%. So you know, you know, there's no reason why that can't be higher. And part of that is just the, the technology of, of this can be shelf stable, right? You don't have to refrigerate this, you don't have to store this, and that's part of that convenience. Also, um, this is a GLP-1 beneficiary. So GLP-1 patients experience a loss in appetite. Protein shakes are a convenient food for patients looking to increase their protein intake when they do not feel hungry. That's a way to you know, make sure you have that protein when you just don't have the appetite. For GLP-1 patients, up to 40% of the weight loss can be due to muscle mass. And rebuilding muscle mass, as Keith and I know, later in life is, is difficult. You don't want to do that because that's also going to make it harder to um, you know, your metabolism after you get off the drugs. So it's, it's really important that you maintain that muscle mass. On slide 26, this growth has actually been quite steady. This isn't like a fad. Everything about this you know, is, is shows you that this growth has, has legs. It's steady and across all channels. This, is, this growth isn't just because they got into the club channel one, one year or they got into Walmart the next year. It's been quite steady and you can see by channel it's been pretty strong all across the board. And I look at that e-commerce <coughs> growth as a sign that, that that's, that's where consumer demand is. They can't find it wherever they're looking and that's why that um, e-commerce growth is so much faster than the other growth. On slide 27, the industry has been short capacity like I said, Bellring, um, you know, they don't make things themselves so they've had to partner with Synopta and Post Holdings. They've both built new greenfield manufacturing facilities to accommodate this growth and more is going to be needed and that will be the future catalyst as, when they announce that and it gives you a little more uh, visibility into the future. And the one that Synopta is making on slide 28, my last slide, is this 330 milliliter Tetra Pak. This is a shelf stable packaging, right? It doesn't need to be refrigerated until you want to consume it. You can consume it, you know, room, uh, room temperature if you like. I think most drinks taste better cold, but that's that's what's been sort of a limiter on on the capacity is having enough of this equipment to make the, these products. 
And new capacity is going to enable additional flavors and promotions. So this is something the company couldn't really do, right? They've been sort of held back on, on, on how fast they can grow because they couldn't really step on the gas pedal. You know, they might have had to remove one flavor to make another flavor. So somebody who might have liked, uh, you know, the special pumpkin spice thing that they couldn't get it, you know, later on, you know, they had to switch to a different flavor. So that's some of the things you can look forward to this year as they're no longer uh, constrained by capacity. Nice. Break down to the 10 seconds. Look at that. Awesome. Um, so a couple things. If you just look at the, first of all, this thing's been a rocket ship. I mean, this is very typical BLC idea where you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, I missed it. Right? And that's the thing about growth in his sector, which we can maybe uh, take a second on. But, you know, the setup is, you know, as long as it holds 56, it's still bullish trade and trend. It has been for a long time. 58 to 62 is the risk range. It's got all the attributes that I like as a growth stock. But it's listed as a consumer staple stock, right? right so right. that's because you know, it's got less than ten billion in market cap. Um, but it's got it's got a growth stock multiple, right? Like, is it, yes. is it, I'm sure that's the first thing people say. Yeah. Just like Celsius, I missed it, and it's the valuation. Right, and, and, and it is. It's a beat and raise story. If it doesn't beat and raise, the stock's not going to go up. But you right. know, I, I, everything I have, I'm modeling a lot of beat and a lot of raise. If that makes sense. <laughs> and, and a 30, a 30 multiple isn't actually aggressive for something growing at this rate. Like anything in my space, which is very few that are growing at this rate, trade at this or a higher multiple. And my estimates are well above. Well, this is, this is the uh, difference between, like if, if you're watching the world's longest running uh, comedy on cable, CNBC, people will immediately look up, you know, the multiple. They don't have a model. Right. Right? So the multiple, if you just look at the multiple on this, would probably be like 50, you know, on a, on a last 12 month basis. So it's useless to make that comment, first of all. Secondly, it's much better to say, on my numbers, it trades at 30 or less. You know, and, that's, and that's a huge advantage that we have, so I just want to say that plainly. But the, the sneaky thing about this idea is that it's the anti-blip one. Because yep. all of our internal research is saying, hey, well, if you listen to Peter Atia on Outlive, you know, uh, the book Outlive, you, you don't want to lose bone density, you don't want to lose muscle mass, and that's exactly what's happening for older people that are on GLP-1, so they really, really need this. Yep. And I didn't, you know, you've talked to me about this stock enough, I didn't actually connect the dots because Emily has been, our, our healthcare uh, policy analyst has been connecting the dots on that recently. Is that something when people talk to you about it that they think, wow, this is, this is the stock? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's got enough coverage on that. You know, the company's just now starting to advertise for that. It's so like, let's say if you, you know, on your social media, you been looking at GLP-1 stuff, they haven't been trying to link that, right? Really? They haven't running any ads because they didn't have any capacity. They didn't even want to press yeah. that lever yet. So additional capacity is going to take off the growth governors, right? This is F1, they're going boom, right? So this is, that's what this year is, beat and race. And the last thing is, can they buy, like there are a lot, like my son uses, I'm sure you, I mean, you, you see it with your kids. Are there niche brands that they could grab for a price, and is that part of the story now? Right. Well, that's what you know. With the leverage going down to two times this year, you're gonna. I don't think you're gonna see share of purchase as much as maybe another brand that they can do the same thing for, right? Because yeah. This is their this is their silo, right? And I think they can do that for others, right? You can take another brand that's maybe not even in beverages and make it into beverages, hmm. and appealing to a you know, core de demographic, right? Hmm. See, he's the staples guy, but he's kind of exciting. Yeah, you know, like it's like. Not flamboyant. Not flamboyant. All right. Thank you, Danny Biolsi, the man. Uh, now we'll go, I, I think it's Steiner on the Zoom. Are, are you bringing me to Europe by chance? No. No! no. I'm bringing you to McLean, Virginia for Capital One. Okay. Um, That's, it's yeah. been a while on that one. You're going to go long Capital One? Yep, yep. Ooh. So. Quick, uh, quick stroll down memory lane here. This is interesting because uh, actually I pitched Capital One on the long side uh, of the pitch uh, back in early 21 uh, at around $100. And by uh, the late summer, early fall, it was at 180. So who says financial stocks can't actually go up a decent amount in a short amount of time? <laughs> um, for basically the last couple of years since early 22, uh, up until uh, pretty recently, uh, we've been bearish on Capital One, and the stock has, uh, over, over that time period, uh, got nearly cut in half. And the reason uh, is really sort of pretty evident on slide 31 here. So if we look at the trend in uh, consumer delinquency rates on uh, their credit card book, uh, you can see on the right side of that chart there, uh, it's been pretty much a one-way train uh, that whole way. So. For the last couple of years, uh, delinquency trends have been uh, deteriorating, worsening, rising uh, pretty steadily. Uh, however, if we go to slide 32, 
If we look at some of the recent uh, dynamics, so this is actually from our macro uh, presentation. Uh, on the left there, you've got credit somewhat or much easier to get versus a year ago, starting to get a little bit better. On the right, you've got uh, the household financial conditions uh, being somewhat or much better. Uh, that one getting a little bit less bad there on the right as well. And then interestingly on slide 33, uh, in the most recent earnings season, from Capital One to Synchrony Financial to Ally, uh, all these companies told a pretty similar story, which is that the 2022 vintage of borrowers uh, were pretty poor in terms of their performance. So you had a lot of COVID cash in 2021 that helped make things better in 2022, at least or appear to be from an underwriting standpoint. Uh, so a lot of easy credit went out the door in 22. Uh, credit's easy to give away. The hard part's getting the money back. And so what we saw over the course of 22 was a very sharp credit deterioration. But the numbers we got in 23 that have had enough time now to develop are indicating that there is stabilization uh, in those trends. And if we look at slide 34, uh, this is a monthly report we put out. It looks at the delinquency trends across the seven largest credit card issuers in the United States. And the table at the top shows the delinquency rates, but the table at the bottom shows the year over year change in those delinquency rates. And what we're interested in uh, is that sequential change in the year over year rate of change, just like we do on the macro side. And most, in fact, six of the seven issuers uh, in late 2023 started to show a second derivative inflection, meaning that the acceleration in delinquency rates uh, actually came to an end and began uh, to flatten out and then initially, uh, well, flatten out and then actually start to get a little bit less bad on the margin. Capital One actually underwent that process earlier in 23. You can see I've got highlighted there the April to July period. Um, but you know these things aren't sort of immediately apparent. They take time to manifest uh, to give a clean read. The next slide, 35, uh, we show the February data. So we just got this data about two weeks ago. And what it shows is that for Capital One, uh, indeed, that trend in February continued. Uh, again, we're going from bad to less bad here. This is how we think about things. Uh, but the increase year over year in February was 100 basis points down from 113. And actually, if we look down the list of all these other issuers, uh, with the exception of Synchrony, which was just flat sequentially, uh, six of the seven issuers all were going in the same direction, meaning uh, less bad and less bad is good. If we go to the next slide, um, this is a look back at the financial crisis. So the blue line there is Capital One's share price. The red line is Capital One's charge off rate. Uh, you can see that the uh, share price bottomed about a year before the peak in charge offs. So uh, the stocks do lead these, uh, these credit metrics by a significant amount. Um, charge offs lag delinquencies by six months. Uh, so that's uh, that's one frame of reference. And then another is on slide 37. So this is the quarterly senior loan officer survey. This is looking at commercial lending. This is the CNI lending cycle. Uh, what we want you to take away from this is that there are uh, very clear cycles in lending activity. This is sort of your proxy for the broader credit cycle. Uh, on the commercial side, you can see over time, um, as these numbers go higher, that actually is bad. That means that underwriting standards are tightening. Uh, and then as they go lower, that's good. That means underwriting standards are loosening. And you can see for the last couple of quarters, the rollover there uh, has become quite real. Uh, standards are easing on the margin. And on the next slide, 38, we look at the same thing, but instead of commercial lending, this is consumer lending. So uh, we see auto lending, card lending, and installment lending all starting to roll over. That's a positive, not a negative. Uh, next slide is some comments from the January earnings report from Capital One from their CEO, basically talking about uh, a number of data points they're seeing that suggest a positive inflection. And then finally, um, real quickly, Capital One is uh, attempting here to acquire one of its uh, largest competitors, Discover uh, Financial. So uh, COF acquiring DFS. What's interesting is on slide 40, historically Discover trades at a premium to Capital One, uh, but because of some issues, uh, Discover has been trading at a big discount in Capital One at a big premium. So they did an all stock deal, great timing on that. 
Uh, and on slide 42, real quickly, this is going to make Capital One the largest credit card company in America. Uh, so in terms of credit loans or credit card loans outstanding, uh, you can see they're going to add that 102 billion at Discover to the 148 billion in Capital One and become significantly larger than what is currently number one, JP Morgan at 211. And on the finally, on the volume side, uh, they are going to become almost as big as American Express uh, by adding Discover, and they'll also get the Discover network. So uh, there's a huge amount of upside uh, in this deal if it can go through. Uh, we'll find out uh, later this year, early next year on that. So I'll, uh, I'll pause there and we can do any questions you've got. Good. Due to uh, me making up the rules, Steiner got an extra minute there because he leads the macro team with me, so he gets preferential treatment. All right. Uh, this one uh, this one is basically not what everything else was, where we're talking about some smaller cap names you know, that could or, or, or would not have a, a growth story to it. Um, just by, and, and by the way, this has been a long, uh, long-standing name of, of Berkshire Hathaway, Dodge and Cox, Capital Group, like really kind of the, the types of investors that would most likely buy more if they believe that the deal is going to get done. Is that like a, is that, is that a big debate right now? And does this, does this deal have to happen for this stock to work? So there's really a couple different things going on. Um, the biggest single thing is the turn in the credit cycle. Yep. Um, if you look back over the last 25, 30 years, uh, these stocks, which are pretty far out on the risk curve within the financials uh, landscape, they are ultimately beholden to that credit cycle. Uh, it drives everything. Like so we said, would be uh, this stock would be along irrespective of the deal on from a macro credit cycle quad two perspective. That's right, and 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 the deal adds significant upside optionality to what's already a good long. So yes, I mean it's it's got like barely no short interest. Um, it trades on like on the headline. This is kind of it'll. It'll often look like a cheap stock. Um, I can't tell people enough that we don't care if a stock's expensive or cheap. If it's cheaper and it has a catalyst, all the better. But if it's expensive, it's probably expensive for a reason. In this case, uh, would be the cyclicality. Now, can you just talk about that, like what peak to trough earnings can look like for, for any company like this? Because it's pretty big. Yeah, so uh, right now, Capital One's trading at about 12 times forward earnings, which is not expensive. Um, it's not as cheap as it could get either, but it's certainly not expensive. In terms of the earnings power, uh, 2023, the company earned a little over $12. Uh, the consensus expectation for 2025 is about $16 and a half dollars. And I think two things are actually going to make that number end up uh, looking very conservative. Uh, one is just the leverage on the credit side. And, and the other is, again, this potential uh, deal with Discover, yep. um, you know, you could easily get to a high teens, even twenty dollar type number, um, which you know at twelve times earnings gets you up into the low to mid two hundreds uh, within a year or two. So you know, from where the stock is right now in the mid one hundreds. So, yeah, yeah. On the signal strength, it just broke out big time. Uh, now it's a momentum stock. It's got the right sector uh, exposure, being cyclical financials. Uh, 141 is the immediate term trade breakout line for those of you that were w w uh, wondering about that. And trend is down at 132. So good one uh, from Steiner. Once again, appreciate that. Uh, jumping to our new head of global technology, the one and only Felix Wong. Hey, Keith. How are you? Um, so, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to discuss everything bearish about Apple in under six minutes, but let me share some of <laughs> You're going to give us the one short and it's Apple. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll, give, I'll give you guys like super short version of it. Um, you know, there's a saying that eating an apple a day makes the doctor go away. Well, right now, Apple needs a doctor or a couple of doctors. <laughs> um, on slide 47, you know, it's good to see that Apple is not a Mimi stock. Uh, it's down more than 10% this year. It's underperformed the NASDAQ by 20 percentage points. That's the worst underperformance in at least 11 years. Uh, on the next slide, you know, January and February combined. All right, so so I, I guess, you know, let me set that back a little bit. So one of the major headwinds that everybody's talking about is China. So I, I have to discuss China um, for for Apple, but on this slide here, you know, 
combined, January and February combined, and you have to do combined here because of the uh, of the calendar shift in the Spring Festival this year. <clears throat> but January and February combined, Chinese smartphone shipments data was up 12% year over year. But Apple's iPhone, as you can see, and I'm going to show you this in the next few slides, but Apple's iPhone saw sharp declines in the first two months, according to my data. And the right chart here shows that, you know, Apple is left out of this recovery in China. And Apple's premium disappeared in China in the second half of 2023 uh, and has since gotten progressively worse. Um, <clears throat> there's some competition in there and there's also some innovation lagging behind. You know, this chart shows me a critical reason why I think Apple's greater China estimates are not low enough. In fact, I think we're the lowest on the street. So let's look more into some data on the next slide. I track, you know, Apple's iPhone sales in China. These are not shipment really data, but actual sales that went through. Okay, actual sales, not just shipments via a few databases. And the first is my own proprietary GMV database as it relates to Apple. Um, I gather iPhone sales data from, from JD, who is actually the largest uh, online third-party vendor for iPhones in China. The data series is pretty tight with Apple's reported greater China sales figures. Again, combined January, February 2024 sales on JD's platform for the iPhone is down 26% year to date for those two months. On the next slide, you know, this chart shows Apple's phone market share in China following the debut of its new phones. Very few people talk, make this kind of comparison, but I, I think it's the right comparison. This is just showing, you know, what now everybody considers iPhone 15 to be a, a pretty dud iPhone 15 versus iPhone 14. Keith, look at this. Every single week since the iPhone 15 made its debut, it's lagged that of the iPhone 14 market share in, phone, in terms of phone activations. You, you can only blame yourself, Apple. On the next slide. So that's the iPhone. Uh, slide, you know, let's look at quickly on the MacBook. With the release of the new MacBook Air M3, you know, I'm already seeing very aggressive price cuts for its older versions. The price cuts are much more aggressive than normal by even Mac OS standards. Look at these Best Buy deals on the left. Meanwhile, Walmart is even in getting involved uh, by selling uh, the MacBook Air M1. You know, this is the first time Walmart has sold any Mac hardware directly to, cons to customers. It's also one of the rare occasions where an Apple product is on sale other than the Apple Store. But don't forget, Amazon is already discounting discounting the new MacBook Air by 100 bucks. So why am I mentioning all of this? Because everybody's talking about iPhone as being a weakness. All right, what about the MacBook? No, nobody talks about that. You know, it's just another example. It shows a deterioration in Apple's product family uh, pricing power. And then AI on the final slide. So let me talk a little bit about this. And we have a little bit less than two minutes. There's been all kinds of AI rumors for Apple. In my pitch uh, two months ago, I went through what I thought were all the rumors that could possibly be associated with the with Apple at that time. And I basically said, none of them surprised me. And why do I say that? Because some other competitor have already done it, okay? Meanwhile, since that time, two months ago, there's been more rumors, okay? And the latest is Google's Gemini, OpenAI, and Baidu may have some partnership with, with Apple to license their Gen AI models on their phones. Now, Edge AI is already very, very hard to, to implement on such a small device. But imagine using someone else's system and a complicated one at that on your iPhone software. There's gonna be many hurdles. Bigger picture here, Apple doesn't look like they have anything transformational by themselves on AI. I mean, what happened to the Ajax project? That was their internal project. I guess those people, you know, don't have much to do these days. Meanwhile, Google and Apple, they're you know they're already buddies on search. 
Now, if they're going to be buddies on AI, what are the regulators going to say? I mean, that's just going to add more fire here, more antitrust scrutiny ahead. Also, why would people buy an expensive new AI phone that's just mocked up just to integrate ChatGPT or Gemini? I, I really don't think it's going to work. Um, the other thing to consider is if this is another sort of tech deal, just to get Google to pay insane amounts of money to Apple, uh, I, I think about who's desperate here. Okay, and it's not Google. So my time has run out. That's you know I have a lot more to say on that, but uh, turn it over to you, buddy. Can, can, can you imagine if the longest running comedy on cable gave you two minutes, never mind six, to pitch Apple short? Uh, I mean, it's just it just. It, it's a sad and it's actually a pathetic thing that, that the CNBCs of the world hate us so much that they don't want to give access to real research to the individuals that are getting body bagged in Apple down 14% now from its all-time high. And that's just to get started, Felix. I mean, I, I look at this, the trend is, is, is not your friend as a bull. 182 uh, is trend, it would have to recapture that. It continues to signal a series of lower lows and lower highs in our daily published risk range, which you can, of course, get in the Momentum Tracker product or in risk ranges. Um, so that's, it's just really, really bad. And when people tell me, uh, when people will say, well, guys, he's bearish and everyone's bearish on Apple now. I mean, that is unequivocal bullshit, right? It has less than 1% short interest. Even Buffett still owns like, what, 7% of the company? In the index, Vanguard's like 10% holder. You know, People might say they're bearish in Apple, but this is the most widely held security in human history. Uh, I mean, I, I think they're saying they're bearish on Apple because the stock just can't go up <laughs> along with the, you know, in the Magnificent Seven index, uh, other than maybe Tesla, you know, uh, they're kind of reacting, right? And then say, oh, that's why I guess we're bearish because the stock doesn't go up. I think the market's getting this right. Keith, I, I think, you know, unless fundamentals drastically improve, unless they're able to show growth, unless they're able to have this so-called Tim Cook breakthrough moment in AI, we'll see. Time is ticking. June yeah, I mean, it, all, all it has is uh, market cap to give, right? It still has $2.7 trillion in market cap. Like, Rob Simone just yeah. pitched a stock that has $2 billion in market cap. Right, so this is actually what happens in Quad Two: is that there are share givers of market cap and and new share gainers. So, so it has that as well. You know who's also uh, quite bearish on it? It appears their general counsel. She sold. I just, I just, you know, as you as you guys talk, I go through my process. But um, what do you think about the legal risks? Quickly, I know Paul Glencher talks about it on the call for us every day. But her name's Catherine Adams, by the way. Twenty three million bucks sold. That's how much Apple no money she made on her Apple. Nice job by her. That's interesting. Uh, I don't have too much comment to say other than that, you know, regulatory hurdles is going to only get worse for, for Apple. And don't be focused on just US and EU where everybody talks about other way around the world. They're also churning out their own potential antitrust, anti-competition bills. So, so also keep an eye on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. most, most people that follow Apple, like that, public, that actually publish a model, they're not lawyers and they're not legal experts. And uh, Felix gets to work with one of the world's best on that. Like I said, Paul Glensher goes back and forth with him uh, on our morning research uh, call, which is called The Call. If you want to watch that, you can do that. Uh, fi finally, bringing in our closer. You know, back when I was uh, living in Canada, the Toronto Blue Jays had a, a closer by the name of Tom Hankey. <laughs> he would just come in there. He had the Coke bottle glasses. So when the Jays were winning, you know, winning the whole thing. Jolt and Joe Carter. You know, off Mitch the Wild Thing Williams. I think of these players when I think of you. Thanks, man. Closers, man. Like it's like <laughs> people are like, "What's McGoff gonna pitch next?" And and that's how people. You know I, what? I literally changed my mind a half an hour ago. No. The, the studio was like so. Because so, he had another one of these. You don't want to know how many of these this guy drinks in a day. I drink about ten. <laughs> um, I, I switch between Celsius and Monster. I'm an equal opportunity caffeine drinker. Um, I have to if I'm going to follow a guy like Felix pitch an apple on the short side, and he's been money on that one. That's been great. You changed it to this? Really? I did. I did. I did change it last minute. So, so just to kind of start off, um, I was going to go with Foot Locker as a long, and I chose not to. And maybe we'll kind of open it up just to show our process. Anytime I'm looking <coughs> for a long a stock, of course I care about the fundamental call. I, I want to be right on the, uh, the multi-bagger over a tail duration or a stock getting cut by 80 percent on the short side. I think that is Foot Locker, but the signal is saying now is probably not 
the right time there. Mm -hmm. um, if I interpreted your emails right, Keith, it's at the high end of its risk range. It's got to hold 28. So um, I went with something that does have signal strength, which is real, real. R-E-A-L is your ticker on that one. We're going opposite Felix on the cap curve on this one. <laughs> but uh, this, is a, <laughs> this, this is a small cap name. It, was a, it, it, it hasn't always been a small cap name. Um, this used to be a $30 stock, and we got on board this one at a buck or a bone, as we call it. Um, and you were also shorted on the way down. We were. Yeah. Um, and now the stock's trading at roughly $380. Um, and I think, you know, in Brian's speak, I think it's going to 10 This is the kind of stock I call an I missed it stock whereby the stock was trading at a dollar and people see it trading at two and they're like, ah, oh, crap, I missed it. And then it goes to three and they're like, ah, oh, I missed it again. And then it goes to 380 and I think that's gonna keep on happening. And there's a couple of reasons why, Keith. So first of all, if you don't know what real real is, I know you do, Keith, but if the viewers out there don't, it's the leading uh, luxury resale authentication model out there. So if you've got a closet full of all the stuff you bought over the course of the pandemic, your Birkin bags and your Rolexes and all this other stuff that people bought, and they did. They bought a lot of consumer goods over the pandemic. If you want to sell those in the secondary market, there's no better place you can go to than Real Real. They authenticate product very well. Uh, they pay a lot of money on their authenticators, um, which I do question how scalable that is. That's one of the concerns I have about this company, but I care about that at $10 or $12 a share. I don't care about that at $3 or $4 a share. Uh, this company has a big competitive moat in one of the r rare secular growth parts of retail, which is uh, luxury uh, authentication and retail. So again, think here like the, the exclusive Nike sneakers. Nike's probably a bad example because that brand has no heat right now. But like uh, again, like Rolex and Kelly bags and things like that that sell for $12,000 a pop. Um, one thing that's important to note about this industry and about this company is it's all about supply. This company needs to get the supply that it can get. Once it gets the supply and it could advertise it, stuff sells like that on its website. So we don't worry about the demand as much as we do about the company just getting the right product to sell. And if you compare it against Amazon's competition here, what goes around comes around. Um, as uh, most people view that as the chief competitor, which it is. And I look at that, I'm like, oh crap, Amazon's com competing in this space. On one hand, that's a very good look that Amazon wants to get into it, but the product that Amazon has through what goes around, comes around, is nothing compared to what Real Real has on its site. So if you're gonna sell that Rolex, you're probably going to Real Real. They've got storefronts uh, and they've got a very good and trusted online business. And again, this is all about supply. And one thing I like about what this new management team is doing, you do have a new management team here, is that they're sourcing supply or they're going to from different parts of the world. Um, so London and Dubai, like real luxury hubs, they're very focused on sourcing this product in new areas where the former, dare I say, incompetent management team, I actually dare, dare me not, I don't care, like they were incompetent um, and they should have gotten fired like they did. Um, and if you're watching this, I'm glad you got fired. Um, so the, there, there, there's one catalyst I think which is likely coming down the pike and that is that I think this company is gonna strike a deal with a European luxury goods company like Keering or LVMH. The truth is, I actually think it's Keering. I think it's for the Gucci brand, which is going through its own problems right now. But it needs a very trusted arm to sell its excess product. I think that's gonna end up being real, real. I don't know anything I shouldn't know, but I think that's gonna come down the pike and I think it'll happen, uh, which will be a good pod one and pod two accelerator. Another thing this company is doing, it's cutting off low value transactions. So the, the, the important part there is if it sells something that's like a hundred bucks, it loses money on that product. So they're cutting off about 20% of their volume. We're about two to three quarters into this. It's lowered GMV, it's lowered their revenue. Um, and now we're gonna, and, and, and the interesting thing about it is that it's hurt, it's helped their profitability. It's helped cash flow, it's helped pod two but it's lowered pod one, which has kept, kept the stock kind of underwater. We're about two quarters away, maybe one quarter away from a pod one acceleration. 
and pod two continue, pod, pods. So if you don't know pods, pod one is revenue. This is hedge I speak. Uh, pod two is cash flow. And we care about both of those things, obviously. And we love when both those accelerate at the same time. We particularly love when those accelerate at the same time in quad two <laughs> and quad one, because small cap names with this kind of factor, factor exposure just rip, as mm -hmm. you always highlight. So you get a pod one, pod two acceleration. The company guided very conservatively for 2024, which I love. I, I usually don't believe company's guidance. I don't believe it here. They guided to negative 8 million to positive 8 million in EBITDA. I think they're going to do 20 or better. So I think you get paid over the wow. term with the pot acceleration and the company beating numbers. Um, the icing on the cake here is that this has been a levered company, which took this stock down in a really big way. Time's up. Um, they kicked the, the can down the road on their debt burden to 2029. At the same time, they're going free cash flow positive. Mm -hmm. And I really like that setup. So I think you got earnings beats, you get pot acceleration, you get a stock that's cheap on underlying earnings that no one's looking at with this company. And uh, the big cash flow turn, I think, is the icing on the cake. It's great. I mean, it, and from a macro perspective, you get, again, it was a raging bear market in small and micro cap stocks, okay? The stock didn't, I mean, stopped going down at like a buck 25 in, at the end of October. Yeah. And a lot of things did, but a lot of people don't characterize the market that way, and I don't care. What we care about is us, us selfish bastards at Hedgeye with our ideas. And when I look at it, I mean, it's, it's got the things I want, small cap, factor exposure, grow, uh, it's got growth. 400 million in cap, I mean, could be a billion in a New York minute. Uh, trend on this thing is 243 a share, so that's an important level to watch from a risk management perspective. Uh, and then just looking at it, I mean, two things. Short interest is still huge, 17%. Mm. Yep. And then you got the CEO, is it John Coral? John Coral. Yep. Guy's he real. bought stock. He did. So you, you meant. The, and John, the, John is not a rich man. Like, he's not one of these CEOs like a Lamonis type who's got all the money in the world. Okay. John's a modest guy who was. He has very, a very good background, but hes it's not like the guy's sitting on a boatload of cash. It's not he's sitting on get a pile paid like if this stock bucket. works. Yeah, that's like, um, <laughs> okay, so walk, like, take both. What do the bears say, the 17%, and, and why would John Coral double or triple this thing? So I think what the bears would say uh, is what I would say with the stock at $12. The bear case on this is that the- At $12? Yeah. Right. 10, 12, 12 dollars, yeah. you pick a number, but a double digit number. Um, is, is that this, and that's probably the time I get out of it. At the same time, Wall Street is upgrading it. Um, the business is fundamentally not scalable. If you think about it, if your job is to authenticate this can of monster and say this is worth three dollars and fifty cents, um, you can only you only have so many hours in the day. Yeah. You can only authenticate so many Rolex watches or a pair of Nike Air Jordans. Um, so that's not really scalable. They've got to add more infrastructure to really build the, the mm -hmm. business up once we get to a certain point of GMB. So I am concerned about that longer term. That's what people flag right now. And I've got bears who tell me, oh, I'll short this thing in a minute if it bounces to three, four bucks a share. Okay, fine. Well, now, good. If you short it at now three, now you just sort of got your face ripped yeah. off. Sure you want to try this again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and bulls, I don't come across a lot of them on this one. And that's what I really like. They'll, they'll be bulls when this is a much higher stock. I mean, you have a, I mean, this hedge, this, this is a hedge fund holding list. I mean, look, you got Ballyasny in there, D. Shy in there. I don't know who uh, these guys are, but it looks like a hedge fund because it's some kind of like Roman god, uh, yeah, et cetera. But I mean, it's like you do have, now I, there are other, you could see companies are shorted against the box if they've been shorted since you went bearish, which is the other part. Uh, or it's just what it is. It's just, it's, it's, they, they'd be willing to take on the risk first, the liquidity risk. 400 right. million's not in, inconsequential. Right. Um, but on those, have you, I mean, I just rattled off a couple of clients, by the way. Like, are they bullish? Like, they must be bullish at those positions. Yeah, they I mean, they they think it's going much higher than ten dollars. Um, I'm this is the kind of name I'm not going to overstay my welcome on it. Like, I, yeah. I've overstayed a couple of names in the past, and I'm not overstaying on real real. But I'm going to respect the pods. I'm going to respect the process. I'm going to respect the model and the underlying research. And it tells me the stock is headed higher. Yeah, the last time McGough and I shared a moment in Quad Two, which was like the full investing cycle, it was awesome, right? It was every like every week we got a new ticker, it, boom, it, shoots up forty yeah. percent. And it's still early in Quad Two. I cannot, and again, thank you for joining us, but I cannot over I can't overemphasize how bad small caps, mid caps, super small caps were up until six months ago. 
it was a raging bear market where everyone went and bought what became the MAG-7. Felix made the point, it's not the MAG-7, we call it the MAG-5 and the terrible two, right? Apple has nothing but cap to give to Real Real, to BYD, to AHR, BRBR. Uh, Capital One looks like a small cap compared to, uh, c compared, to, compared to Apple. But again, I hope you have a fine appreciation for the well-roundedness of the process, like how we connect the quads top-down macro to bottom-up analysis uh, you know, with all the analysts, how we think about factor exposures. This is how you really think through an idea in full. Nobody else does it this way. Certainly nobody is going to give it to you for free. Uh, if you want to pay 2 and 20, they'll explain to you why they pay McGough, by the way, for these ideas, uh, which is great. Yeah, it's great. We're, we're communities building. People really like Brian McGough in Quad 2. Please don't fall in love with them as much as he falls in love with these energy drinks in Quad 2, because that's what he's going to look like, because a lot of his stuff uh, tends to go vertical in Quad 2. Thanks for joining us.